gets down into darkness opened my eyes lets me see beauty that's made this heart Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello, my name is the Reverend Kate Botley. Welcome to this service from my home. You're especially welcome if this is your first time worshipping with us in this way. I encourage you to join in with the prayers, songs and responses. All the component parts of today's act of worship have been recorded separately and edited together. I'm really thankful to everyone involved in creating today's service. Today's reading from the Gospel is the story of two disciples on the road to Emmaus, a journey which begins deep in sadness and disappointment and ends with the realisation that they are in the presence of the risen Lord. It's a story that's especially significant for us this Eastertide. We are, as a nation and in our communities, conscious of the challenges and problems in the world at the moment, and the joy of the risen Christ can often feel far away.
We're sometimes like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We don't always recognise the work of God in our lives or the face of Christ in the faces of the people that we journey with. So let's take a moment to come to God who knows the secrets of our hearts to ask for forgiveness and peace. A moment of silence. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. So may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and his peace, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading from Acts tells the story of a moment of realisation when Peter proclaimed to the people of Jerusalem that Jesus was the Messiah. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Therefore, let the whole, the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptised, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From my time.
Alleluia, Alleluia. Jesus said, All who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Alleluia. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they, when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. I'm speaking to you this morning from my dining room. It's hard to believe that just a few weeks ago to celebrate my birthday at the end of February, this room was filled with friends sitting elbow to elbow, tucking into a feast that I'd spent hours preparing. Sharing food with friends has always been one of my favourite things to do. Over this dinner table, I've enjoyed feeding people, trying out my latest recipes on them, and spending hours talking about life, love, and everything in between. Something wonderful happens when we break bread together. It's in the sharing of food and the meeting of hearts and minds that we can sometimes go from being acquaintances to being friends. In fellowship, we move from knowledge of each other to intimacy, a deeper level of understanding, recognition, and love. In sharing something of our hearts, we reveal who we are and invite others in to see us in return. I know that I'll see my friends again and look forward to the day when this room is filled with food and friendship and fellowship. But I also know there are so many people across our nation and our world right now 
who are grieving because they won't see their loved ones again, at least not in this life. And my heart breaks for them. The passage we heard earlier gives the account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I can imagine the pain and disappointment they felt, thinking that they would never see Jesus again. They found themselves in the shadow of the tumultuous events that had taken place. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who they had followed and in whom they had placed their hope, had been brutally killed. Although as they made their way to Emmaus, they were walking in the light of the resurrection, they didn't know it yet. They found themselves still in the sorrow of Good Friday. And so, of course, as they are walking to Emmaus, a few miles from Jerusalem, they're talking about all that had happened. I'm sure they could think of little else. In the account of their journey, we are told they begin sad and disappointed, but open to what the stranger who joins them has to say. It is only when he shares the sacramental meal with them that they recognise him. It's significant that there are several examples of Christ revealing himself around a table. The Last Supper before his crucifixion is the Eucharist we remember in our churches. And after his resurrection, there are a number of examples of Jesus meeting the disciples in fellowship around a table while eating together. The account of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is a wonderful image of the journey each of us who has chosen this way of Christ goes on. From despair and disappointment to revelation, through relationship and fellowship with Christ, and then to proclamation, a desire to tell everyone of the good news we've heard about. It's a reminder that we walk this road together, with Christ alongside us and with other believers. For me, one of the positives of the crisis in which we find ourselves is this recognition that we need each other. Some weeks ago, I posted letters through all the doors on my street, inviting people to join a messaging group so we could support each other. I've been overwhelmed by the response. All day, every day, we share stories of hope. We support each other. We share what we have from bananas to yeast, to jigsaw puzzles, to toys for our children. We're planning a street party when this is all over, where over music and fun and food, we'll foster even stronger bonds and be able to look each other in the eye and be drawn into deeper relationship. Like the disciples in their knowledge of Jesus, I had made assumptions about those living in my community. I knew about them, but I didn't really know them. After years of our nation having seen chasms open up between political and ideological and ethnic groups, I've loved realising that in the end, we all need the basics to survive. Food, friendship, fellowship. Each of us is part of the human family, each of us made in the image of God. We walk this road together. Our lives are infinitely bound up with our neighbours, locally, nationally, and also globally. We live in an increasingly interconnected world. Our local community is global, and our global community is just a click away. Coronavirus has shown us that our futures are bound more tightly together than ever before. I think somewhere along the way, perhaps we had lost sight of this. Many of you will have been gearing up to be one of the thousands of supporters who as part of Christian Aid Week knock on their neighbours' doors to tell them how they can support those living in extreme poverty around the world. As we move our efforts online, the need to help the poorest and most marginalised through this pandemic remains even more urgent. People living in poverty are already facing a lack of water, food and medical care. As coronavirus infection rates speed up in poorer countries, it will put a massive strain on already fragile health systems. This will be catastrophic. Through our partners and local churches, we're having a life-saving impact where it counts, endeavouring to work with communities on the ground to help limit the impact of this deadly virus. It's at times like this, the worst of times, that we need to recognise we are all in this together. That in the end, it's all about love. 
because love never fails. Coronavirus impacts all of us, but love unites us all. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Love compels us to gather around the table, to stand together, elbow to elbow, in solidarity with our neighbours near and far. Love compels us to fight against coronavirus alongside our sisters and brothers living in poverty. Love compels us, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, to tell others about the hope we found through the encounter with the risen Christ. Because at the end of it all, we know that we walk this road together. In the words of Mary Oliver, I tell you this to break your heart, by which I mean only let it break open and never close again to the rest of the world. Let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins. In accordance with the scripture, he was buried. He was raised to life on the third day. In accordance with the scriptures, afterwards he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received and this we believe. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we stand in awe at the fact that you are always with us, showing your constant love in these difficult and distressing times. When so many people have suffered and died, even those known to us amongst our families, and friends. We look to you, our God, trusting you to shine your light on us in our grief and hardship. We trust you to guide us at this time and to bring healing to those who are sick 
and comfort to those who mourn. We also pray that as we reach out to others to comfort and support them, whether with them physically or apart, that you will bring comfort to us and uphold us. Let your light shine through the turmoil of our confusion and bring us the love and hope we can share with a world that is so in need of your hope right now. Thank you that in our difficulties we can turn to you and know you. And thank you too that you give us the task to bless your world with support and compassion. Amen. Almighty and merciful Father, you show your great love for all that you have created in your world. We pray now for your swift help and for your sovereign power to overcome the spread of the coronavirus causing so much sickness and death to your world. We pray for that world and all who are affected in so many different ways. Bring healing to those who suffer. Bring life to the dying and comfort those who have been bereaved. We pray for all who are working to find solutions to the pandemic, that they will soon be successful. And we ask that you strengthen and uphold our government, scientists and health authorities in their fight. Empower them with your wisdom, your strength and your grace to overcome. Amen. Now we pray for my community, for the deaf community. Deaf people in the country are often isolated and within that community there are particularly vulnerable people, the elderly, the deaf blind and deaf people with mental health issues. Many live in worry and confusion because they have little access to good information even the most basic government information, to stay home and only go out when absolutely necessary has passed them by. And we think of those who continue to help and support the community, going to work with the fear that they may catch the virus or pass it on to someone else. We pray for families where there are deaf children and where there may be communication difficulties between family members leading to frustrations. We pray for volunteers and key workers to support our community, working together to uphold it. We pray for all of us, for the deaf community, for an outpouring of your grace, your comfort, your strength and your wisdom as we work together to beat back the effects of the virus. Amen. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's service. All that's left for me to do is to pray God's blessing over all of us. 
The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.